everyone. Welcome to week three. Before we get started on this module, I just wanted to give you some feedback on the discussion posts. They're looking very good. Some of the things I do want to ask for, though, and I sent an announcement about this, and you'll have gotten personalized feedback on your own posts, but the most important things are be sure to use APA citations. I will, for the most part, be actually putting the APA citation for the materials in the just like in the module itself linked there at written in APA format. But I want you guys to get used to understanding what that is and how to create an APA format citation because you're going to need it for your paper at the end because you're going to actually cite your your observational site is going to have to be listed in an APA format as well. So we're going to talk about how to do that closer to the time that's necessary. Also, definitely make sure you're using APA citations in text, right? So there's a specific format for how you do that when it's in text and you're putting what page number you're referring to with the direct quote. A note on direct quotes. They are important. You do need to be making specific references to the reading. It can be paraphrased, but you should tell me where in the reading it came from. It does not need to be exactly a direct quote, but it should say so. On this page, he talks about this concept, right? Those should also not be the same direct quotes or paraphrased topics that are in the lecture. If I see that, and some of you will have noticed this in your grades, there's a kind of point reduction basis for that. It doesn't mean I'm going to give you no credit, but if you want the A, I need to see evidence that you're thinking about this reading beyond what I'm saying about it in these lectures. And then related to all of that is that most of you gave me very good summaries. So you're telling me what's in the reading. And some of you did really great. Some synthesis or comparisons where you're talking about what's happening in one reading versus, versus another and the way that they are perceiving things. And that's also great. The next step of that is how does that understanding of what they're trying to say, especially in relationship to each other, help you think through what you're seeing in the media environments that you all live in, right? We all live in a deep social media environment. So you are going to have opinions and you're going to have thoughts about what you're coming in contact with in the world through these lenses, right? So for instance, for week one, maybe the way that Jenkins sees participatory culture as largely positive and democratic doesn't match up with your experiences. Maybe it does. Tell me why, right? Or maybe you see some balance between he and Fuchs's view. And then for our second week, when we're talking about self-representation, one of our texts was pretty positive and connected selfies to a long history of self-representation and self-representation as essentially pretty empowered for the most part, right? Versus our second reading, which saw it as a reproduction of gender stereotypes that actually might be reinforcing some pretty negative things for people. So again, what do you think about those? What do you think about those distinctions between those ideas and how you experience your own media environment? I know this week is going to be kind of a sensitive topic for that. So I'm not necessarily expecting you to feel comfortable giving us a lot of details about your personal friendships or romantic relationships and how those work online. So for this week, I understand if everybody stays a little bit more abstract, but just definitely keep this in mind that what we're trying to do for our readings is utilize them as tools for ways to talk about what it is that we're seeing so that when it comes to the end and you're doing an analysis of your site and you want to use these readings to help you make an argument or to help you process what you're seeing and come up with some analysis and interpretation of the patterns that emerge from those faces, you will have some practice in how to do that. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into week three. We're talking about friendship, love, and intimacy online. I again pushed back our conversation about affect and emotion. So that'll be next week. Okay, so for our first reading, we have personal connection in the digital age, and you have a selection from this called New Relationships, New Cells, question mark, by Nancy Bame. Nancy Bame is currently a senior principal researcher at man at, and manager at Microsoft in New England. She's no longer working in academia, um, but she was the author of Personal Connections in the Digital Age when she was previously teaching in Kansas. She's also written a lot about fan communities and music, fandoms in particular. She does a lot on different kinds of connections that get built in social networking spaces. So related to her work in the world of music and music fandoms and communities, she also became a character in a comic book series called Great Moments in Rock and Roll done by 
Joel Orff, who does this series where people tell stories about their experiences in the culture. And so this is interesting for the way that she's going to be talking about some of the stuff we're thinking about today, because she's interested in how the communities that we participate in, the things that we like, the ways that we align ourselves with communities of fandom are also ways that people then actually end up building their own identities and how that connects to different kinds of relationship building. So you can check this out on her website if you're interested. So I know some of you may be unfamiliar with some of the terms that exist in this. Some of these have actually shifted even in media studies and aren't as commonly used. SNS is in particular. We don't necessarily talk about all of them as social networking sites now. They've been differentiated a lot more. But this is any online vehicle for creating relationships with other people. This includes Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. She's talking about everything. What, WhatsApp, all these things together. Muds and moos are a little bit more complicated. A moo is an object-oriented mud. And a mud is basically a multi-user domain or multi-user dimension. These were text-based games initially. And then moos are the same, but they're object-oriented, meaning that they also allow for additions. Can, they can be built. This is coders being able to make more effects in that space. Um, and also, I think it tends to include the addition of more visuals. You can look up more details on this, but I just wanted to give you guys a quick rundown on what she's talking about because she doesn't clarify all of them. Okay, so the selection that you have from Nancy Baim is New Relationships, New Selves, and she's talking about concepts of mediated meeting and how these spaces are perceived, especially in relationship to honesty. She starts with a little anecdote about a former student of hers who begins his relationship to online spaces talking about chat rooms and things like that by pretending to be a young, conventionally attractive woman and sees what happens in that experience. And then that informs the way that he engages when he then actually goes into those spaces with the and how that partner is found through them having both location and some affinities in common. So this brings us back to some of the things we were talking about with affinity spaces. Um, and she's talking about it in terms of affinity algorithms, matching people up. And this whole chapter is really looking at questions of honesty and identity that are built into that little anecdote that she's telling, right? Where people, that this couple tells their meet, meeting story to are suspicious that he would have been presenting himself falsely. And this opens her whole chapter into looking at the different ways that we engage in these things. And so some terms that she gives us are mediated meeting, meaning that whether it's the algorithm or specific participation in certain kinds of sites, like dating sites like eHarmony, it's a difference of how people are meeting versus, quote unquote, bumped into each other um, who share interests. And if you think about her relationship to the music scene, um, obviously she's drawing some connections here of people coming together through affinity of shared interests of music as well. And she's just looking at how that happens once you start including algorithms into that. And I gave you guys some fun old images of what AOL Messenger <laughs> looked like at the time period she's talking about. So in that anecdote and her breakdown of that story she's talking about, how affinity spaces are not so different in online mediated meeting, but she's also saying that there obviously are some major differences. And one of the things she points out is that our identities are disembodied. Um, and what that means simply is just that because there is not necessarily, at least in these early days, especially the internet, especially AOL, where there's no image, there's no video, who you are is who you say you are. So you can shift who you say you are and experience who you are. And she has this anecdote of this kind of funny comic up here on the left-hand side of life before the internet of people pretending, quote unquote, to be different things or maybe experiencing, expressing different identities, but not having any context in which to do that except for their own mind, right? So she points out that digital media affords the separation between ourself and our body. And that separation leads to disembodied identities that exist through words and actions as opposed to what we look like and how other people place us based on those things. And what's interesting about this, obviously, for many of you, the way that this would be questionable would be the use of deep fakes and filters and things like that that people can play with because this you have never really existed as, as adults on the Internet in a time before 
the ease of physical representation, right? It's a lot harder um, outside of like a few spaces like Reddit boards or discords to exist um, at, in a disembodied way. This is different for you. Um, instead, but embodiment is something that can be shifted. But one of the things that I think is really important for us to think about, and it connects with our reading last week, is her connection to Irving Goffman. Our buddy Irving Goffman is back this week from a different book. Last week, we were talking about his analysis of advertising representation. This week, we're talking about a really famous book of his from 1959 called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And what he says here is that self-representations are about managing our sense of self and other people's perception of us and that they are always multiple and always flexible and we're always shifting them. So she's making this connection that this is not necessarily exclusively because of disembodiment, that the affordances of disembodiment maybe make that easier, but this is something we've always done. And on the next slide, I have a little short rundown of Goffman's theory. <laughs> All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. The sociologist Irving Goffman took these lines from As You Like It very seriously. In his dramaturgical account of human interaction, he argued that we display a series of masks to others, enacting roles, controlling and staging how we appear, ever concerned with how we are coming across, constantly trying to set ourselves in the best light. According to Goffman, we play a range of different parts, determined by the situations we take ourselves to be in, and how we think we are coming across. We adapt what we are, depending on who we are interacting with. This is most apparent in awkward situations where we suddenly find ourselves trying to play two inconsistent roles, as, for example, when we accidentally encounter friends from very different social groups and have to juggle masks. The analogy with acting only goes so far for Goffman, though, because, in his view, there is no true self, no identifiable performer behind the roles. The roles just are the performer. He challenged the idea that each of us has a more or less fixed character, a psychological identity, at least in the role of author of The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, he did. That's Stephen Fry's voice. You may know him if you've taken Intro to Media. A lot of sections use his documentary called The Machine That Made Us about the birth of the printing press. He does some really great little videos about different kinds of media innovations, and he has a podcast too. But what's really important to us in thinking about this is that identity or the way that we represent the self is something that is flexible to some extent, right? And that we are always making those kinds of distinctions and this helps to push against the technological determinist perception of social media as necessarily distinct from other ways that we exist in identity building and, and in engagement with one another, right? So she moves on to the section on cues and competence and how people navigate these different spaces. And she talks about how important it is for people to both individuate themselves and using different tactics for doing that, whether that's the images that we associate with ourselves and avatars or the photos we post of ourselves and the languages that we use, whether that's how we frame a thing or the name that we assign ourselves. And she says that some of this is also not completely free, that SNS site engineer identities in a lot of ways as well by giving us limited categories to choose from and how we report ourselves, right? And then that then leads to certain kinds of algorithmic sorting, whether that's by gender or nationality or interest or any of those things. And then she asks a question to you about like how much we, how do we think about this distinction of both wanting to be individuated and also in other ways, how we want to fit in. And she sets up different sites and says that some increase affordances or interests and in individuation and others 
make us more interested in fitting and in groups. And she notes that Facebook in particular is one where people really end up in kind of siloed groups versus old school MySpace <laughs> where people were much more interested in kind of differentiating themselves even among their small friend groups. And she then also moves on to how personal identity, which is constructed through the choices that we make about how we modify something or the names that we assign ourselves or the images we choose to put forward of ourselves in self-representation, if we think back to last week, that we also then are being created. Our identities are not free-floating, that we are not only self-constructed, but that information is put out about us by other people, right? Our friends post pics of us. People make other kinds of connections. We are listed among different groups. Who we follow, who follows us, all of those things may become available in ways that don't um, necessarily depend on the choices that we're making. And then that means that identity is a kind of complex mix of the personally constructed. Again, if we go back to Goffman and the choices that we're making, and then also some of them have to co come in about how we are moved around and defined by others and how they're representing us as well. She also describes how race and nationality play out in these online spaces and as a questions of social identities and argues that affordances for self-representing one's race or nationality vary de depending on the site or platform in question. And that can be one of those categories, right? The limited categories in which we get to represent who we are. Sometimes identities are encouraged and explicit where you say that you're from a certain race or nationality or you check a box, whereas others can be inferred. And she talks about that in terms of cues and competencies. So maybe that means mentioning certain kinds of food or using certain kind of languages, right? She talks about people saying bollocks and British slang versus other kinds of norms of communication. And that can be something that people can somewhat choose how much of that they engage in. And so, of course, this comes down to questions of what we talked about in previous sessions of code switching that can happen in social media environments where people take on not necessarily fully different identities, but where there are shifts in what kinds of communities they're marking themselves as part of through the use of certain cues and codes. Bain comes back to this conversation about honesty and expectations of honesty and deception online, and she does it through a conversation about anonymity and authenticity. And I just want us to unpack the ways that we tend to think about anonymity and authenticity in common practice. I think we tend to perceive them as diametrically opposed, right? So on one end of the spectrum versus the other. And on the one end is, an, is the anonymous person who is nefarious, who does not like, who is sneaky, who is trying to say things that they wouldn't say in other contexts, who might be there for violent or abusive reasons, or it's actually like criminal and attempts for like identity thefts, et cetera. Anonymity is always presented as this kind of negative space. And on the other, we are often presented with the idea of like total authenticity of people sharing all aspects of their life as them being more trustworthy. And she, I think, unpacks this a little, right, and has a more nuanced view that there are positives and negatives associated with being upfront about who you are versus maintaining certain amount of authentic, a certain amount of anonymity. And think about that in relationship to other people, right, and reasons why people might want to be anonymous. So she talks, for instance, about how somebody who, like a queer teenager, might feel more comfortable coming out in a certain space where they can be anonymous from, like, other aspects of their life and that there's a certain degree of safety in that. She talks about women in particular. She's citing safety as their reason for anonymity, right? And then when she gets onto the concept of authenticity or people somehow maybe deceiving one another a little bit online, not being wholly honest. What she's talking about is that these tend to be minor strategic manipulations of presenting the best self. And in dating sites, she also talks about it as largely aspirational, right? That somebody uses a younger photo of themselves because that's maybe how they hope they'll appear, um, that they're, they're working on themselves, they're quitting smoking, whatever. So they might present information that is not wholly accurate because there's an expectation that's a goal that they're moving towards. And this kind of connects to some of our questions about identity, right? If someone understands themselves to be a particular way, are they necessarily lying? 
if the way that they're presenting themselves is more in alignment with that understanding than it is with other people's descriptions of them or understandings of them. It's an interesting question. It's a pretty large philosophical debate to get into, right? She also talks about how the reduced cues and distance that we experience online may encourage some people to be more honest by removing those risks too, right? So we have multiple ways that we engage in anonymity and authenticity, all of us as individuals, in the way that we exist online. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to our next text when we're thinking about love at first swipe. But just a moment to take a pause and just to say that because this brings up some questions about how people might feel about anonymity and authenticity in general and online experiences and spaces, um, if anyone in the class has any concerns about any of this or about their own presentation in this class, please do let me know. So for our second text, and this one is um, an academic journal article, and our previous one was an academic book chapter. That's a common split that we'll probably have a lot throughout the semester, just to give you familiarity with both kinds of writing and presenting information. And you'll see they're quite different, right? Um, for instance, Julia Renzini and Christopher Lutz in their article, Love It First Swipe, they are doing more of a quantitative research on online dating and Tinder in particular. And they take a different approach to presenting how that how that research was designed and the kinds of responses they got before giving us their analysis and interpretation. Thinking about these two different modes of presenting and collecting data is something that I want you guys to have kind of in the back of your mind as you're starting to think about how you might want to be approaching your own research. So one thing I want us to get really comfortable doing throughout the semester is noticing how to find and identify the research question, the methods, et cetera, of all of the academic journal articles that we're reading here. For Ranzini and Lutz, the research question or the research motivation, because sometimes it isn't an explicit question, their interest is to explore Tinder user self-representation authenticity on the app in relationship to a set of demographics and motivational and psychological antecedent. And what that means is preconditions that were given to them as options or conditions that they are able to express through another part of the data collection process that they have. They had this limited list of motivations that people can choose from. They had a series of tests that were set up by other researchers that they were then able to use data from in order to categorize their respondents. And then they had demographics. All of this is information that is based on self-identification and self-declaration. So that means that the people they're talking to are telling them the answers to these questions. We'll talk a little bit more about that and how that might affect their findings when we get to the limitations section. Okay, so what are their conclusions? What is it that they find through this exploration? They argue that LBRTD apps such as Tinder and Grindr, although their study is actually limited to Tinder, because they make use of mobile media, in other words, they're using cell phones and that they travel, um, they therefore represent a distinct type of online dating, which is partly different from communicative affordances in traditional online dating portals like Match.com and OkCupid and eHarmony and all of those, right? And their focus, again, is specifically on Tinder. Some of the issues with that will also come up when we talk about the limitations of the study. So what's differentiating Tinder as a set of technological affordances from other online dating sites like Match.com is that they have the mobility affordance and a synchronicity affordance. And mobility means that obviously it is set to the, it's on a mobile device. Um, a person can set specific locations and ranges to look in. So that means you can travel to a nightclub or a festival or something like that and set a pretty tight range for how far you want it to be looking around you. And that can then lead to potentially a, a match that's in very close physical proximity to you. All of this also happens very quickly, it can happen. So synchronicity, as soon as you're matched with somebody, you can immediately communicate with them. And that location matching happens in real time as well. So you can see a map of where people are and find them, right, is the idea. So if we go back to what the motivations are, the, the motivation antecedents, so whether that's like hooking up or looking for friends or looking for validation or whatever it might be, um, 
those affordances are then like they inform how people might meet those motivations and the kinds of usages that they might have for them. So even though they identify that there are people who are using Tinder to make friends or for personal validation, they're also making some distinctions between how Tinder creates a kind of network of community of, of connections versus how other social networking sites do. So Facebook incentivizes users to have anchored relationships that more closely resemble their real life connections. Whereas dating sites like Tinder and Grindr pressure users to project an identity that is desirable for persons that they don't yet know but wish to attract. So there's a kind of performance that goes on that's maybe more explicit um, with online dating because people are trying to put their best foot forward. If we go back to some of the stuff we were thinking about with Gothman, right, there's a certain degree of per perception management or impression management that's happening in these spaces. People want to look good. They're using the best possible photo frames for themselves. And we can think about this too, all the way back to the way we were talking about selfies, right? Because essentially these dating sites depend on representations of the self that even if they might be taken by another person and therefore don't technically fit the frame of selfie, they are still choices that we're making about how we represent ourselves. And so some of those complexities about expectations of authenticity, what authenticity means, and how one re like presents the self in a way that might be favorable or aspirational, as we talked about in the first reading, this all comes into play in how someone's making a dating app presentation of themselves, right? Okay, so I want us to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of this study. So they make the claim that because of the predominantly heteronormative nature of most dating sites, sexual orientation hasn't been studied in connection with gender and online self-presentation. I think it's really important for us to note that this was published in 2016. And so that may have been true at the time, but it is no longer true now. Since then, new research in this area has been done and the apps themselves have changed, which we'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, but before we talk about that, I also want us to talk about data sets, because I think this is something for you guys to think about when you're thinking about what kind of a participatory culture site you want to be looking at. Data set can come from a lot of different places. So there's a lot of ways they could have gathered this data. There's only 500 respondents for their research, which is a pretty small number. And they didn't really set out to, to limit age or gender or education spaces. They just took whoever would respond through an online app called Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is a pretty much, it's, I think it technically still exists, but fairly defunct from what it once was. Amazon offered this process by which you could get people to do small digital tasks online all through this app. You would log on and you would see different tasks that were available and you could agree to them. And they, but the thing about it is they paid really minimally, usually fractions of a cent per task. Sometimes they mentioned how long it would take to do it. Sometimes they didn't, right? And so if you saw that a job was paying really little, you might not want to sign on for it if it didn't tell you how long it was going to take, right? So there are interesting motivations for how this might affect the people who are willing to participate. And then the other part of that I think is important to note is that means then that all of the people who are participating in this study, all of the information that they're gathering about their antecedent information, so whether and demographics, age, education, all of that is entirely based on self-reporting. And what we know is that self-reporting is complicated and sometimes people are not necessarily fully authentic in the way that they self-report. They might be offering answers that they think are more desirable. So these are just important things to think about in how we're approaching the places that we're studying and how we're thinking about selecting our data sets. The other thing about Mechanical Turk is that it is global. So there may be differences in people's responses that are not being categorized in an important way that's affecting the way that their data appears. And they make notice of some of these things, but not all of them. So just thinking about this as you move forward, how do you want to limit the participatory culture site you're looking at? Do you want to follow a Reddit board? Do you want to think about doing a kind of a study 
where you're looking at something that is more location based. So for instance, the platform page for Instagram or something like that's specific to Rutgers, right? There are ways that you can think about these kinds of questions. Just something to have in the back of your mind as we're moving forward. And then another thing that's really critical here is that in this emerging area of queer studies online and BIPOC studies online, there are a lot of ways that things are changing, and these things are also affecting the apps, right? So related to those limitations, right, when we're thinking about what limitations do, when we're thinking about the way that we frame a study and how we collect our data, that really strongly affects the kind of findings that we have, right? So their findings actually, they determined that queer users were potentially be, we're showing up as less authentic in their self-representation, right? Now, they make that kind of blanket statement that Tinder at the time was very heteronormative, and maybe that was the reason for it. There's a whole number of reasons that they are also or maybe not considering, right? For one, because there's no question about where folks are located, what kind of cultural contexts they're coming from, whether or not they are already in committed relationships, whether or not they feel secure and safe in their sexuality and the communities that they're part of, none of those things were asked. So if we go back to our first reading, people are inauthentic or anonymous or pretend to be different for a whole host of reasons, some of which tie into safety. So as a result of the limitations that they identify in Tinder, a lot of things have changed since 2016. In response to user complaints and public backlash over their lack of inclusiveness, Tinder did in fact change its gender identity and sexual orientation options. Also in participation with the LGBTQIA plus nonprofit GLAD on 2019, they announced nine categories for sexuality and you can choose up to three of them. And then they also have a wider selection of, um, of gender identities that can also be chosen now as well. So that's really interesting and has large impacts, right? So a study looking at the same kind of information, also with maybe more specific demographic frameworks, might have really different findings. This is something to just keep in mind. The way we ask our question as researchers has as much to do with our findings, with our conclusions, as the data itself does, right? So we have to be thinking a lot about how we're framing the questions that we're asking and the way we're gathering our data. Okay. So that's the end of our discussion of our readings. I'm going to leave you with this short film that you guys can watch. It's only about 10 minutes called Connection Lost, the Tinder opera. And I've linked that in our module. And you'll see that there are a lot of concepts from the readings that maybe apply to this short film. I hope you might find it funny. It's, it's a strange little piece. Also, think about whose perspective the story is being told from and how that might align or not align with some of the things that we've been learning about gender, about affordances of technologies, and from this last reading, motivations of interest and how they play into self-representation in online spaces and relationship building. Okay, that's it for this week. Have a good week. Thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.